It's now my pleasure to turn the microphone over to my colleague and friend, Jonathan Lamb. John is Associate Professor of English. He writes and teaches about Shakespeare, and his first book, Shakespeare in the Marketplace of Worlds, was published by Cambridge in 2017. And he's at work on a lot of projects, but I'm just going to let him go from here because I've already talked long enough. Thank you all very, very much. The wedding planner thing actually makes perfect sense now. <laughs> I came in the first thing that was a boutonniere. Before I start, I want to do something that I have never done before here in this room and never will again. If you'll indulge me, I feel so powerful. Thank you, Beth and Kevin and everybody else. This is a really fun chance to say why I love the Spencer Library, why I think it's an incredibly special and important place, and various people in the back. There are seats up front. You don't need to be bashful, Carl. Come on, you can do it. Um, now I lost my train of thought. Thank you is what I was saying. Thank you very much. Um, here we go. So the word relevance has a pretty boring beginning. Like the adjective relevant and the noun relevancy, Relevance began life in English as a legal term, specifying that something is sufficient, adequate, or pertinent to a case. Hold on, is it disappearing? Hold on, wait for it. Yeah. I found that out on PowerPoint earlier. Only later did the word come to refer to the pertinence of something to the matter at hand. Like what I mean when someone CCs me on an email that has nothing to do with me, and I reply with an angry email that asks what relevance the message had for me, or what you might mean when you ask what relevance the word relevance has for the Spencer's 50th anniversary. I'm glad you asked. Over the last century, relevance has exploded in popularity. Here is a Google Ngram chart showing the relative frequency of the term. Don't worry, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about relative frequency. As you can see, starting in the mid-1940s until around 1970, the use of the word relevance increased sixfold and has continued a steady climb since then. Relevance, it seems, has never been more relevant. See what I did there? More than at any point in human history, people are concerned with things being, and I'm quoting from the dictionary now, Opposite to the needs, values, and demands of the moment. Relevance is a coordinate, you might say, of post-World War II modernity, with its strong emphasis on the present, usually at the expense of the past. All the best and worst qualities of the modern world, the individual as the locus of moral responsibility, the separation of civic and religious life, the scientific uh, method as the horizon of knowledge, politics oriented around rights and possessions, settler colonialism, global capitalism, public bathrooms, lawn care, all these qual that was a joke. All these qualities of modernity promote relevance as a singular virtue. And I'm not here to say relevance is bad. I'm saying all these things promote it as a singular virtue. Make it new, the poet Ezra Pound said, which we might rephrase in 2018 as Make it relevant. Now, what does this have to do with the Spencer Library? I'm also glad you asked that again. That was in the script. A world that cherishes relevance, like a world that values profit above all goods, may look askew on a place like the Spencer, which holds several hundred thousand items from the recent and distant past. Confronted with a world like ours, with problems like ours, it's easy to regard the Spencer's collections with a polite indifference. A nice enough thing to have if you can afford it, but not really relevant. But here's the catch. And the fact that you all know what I'm going to say makes it more meaningful, not less. It is perhaps painfully obvious to remind you that we cannot know the future. We simply can't. Recent elections, the Weather Channel, and critics of Google's predictive algorithms have reminded us of this. Not even Google knows the future, even if it can guess that you have the flu. 
We, ne we can't know the future. So the only thing to which we can compare the present is the past. Whether we look to the past as a storehouse of wisdom and virtue and exemplary human achievement, or as a series of cautionary tales reminding us of just how much wickedness and depravity and violence humans are capable of, the past does not merely inform the present. It constitutes it. Not just some, but all human and knowledge and experience exists, as it were, with respect to the past. But we have to go a step further. Not only is the past the only thing to which we can compare the present, the best way for the past to become knowable and distinct is through the material objects that remain from the past. I'm going to say all that again because it's really important. The only thing we have to compare to the present, hold on, there's the present, is the past. There's the past. And the only way the past becomes knowable and distinct is by way of material objects that remain, the kinds of objects held, conserved, and made available in this amazing institution. This makes a place like the Spencer not a liability or even a luxury, although as we all know, it is very luxurious, especially those lamb chops. I assume that was a compliment to me. It makes it a part of the constitution of knowledge. So let me show you a few examples of how this constitution works. I won't keep you long, maybe like four more minutes. Hold on, I need some more water. <laughs> Woo! You're welcome. I could do some improv jokes. No, I'm not. Uh, so first, uh, here we go. Oh, Batman and Shakespeare are here, incidentally, to provide a sense of scale, since I can't bring the, the books out right now. Uh, so first, people like to talk about how we're in an age of data. There's even a new kind of job you can get, data scientist, one that supposedly specializes in manipulating massive amounts of data. It's really cool. The rhetoric around data science is often one of emergence, as if big data is new and unprecedented in human life. Now, what data scientists do with their big data, they mostly find relationships among things. So they ask things like, what three products do people buy at Walmart when they're about to buy a house or have their house foreclosed on? What are the demogra demographic predictors of ADHD in children? What will people watch on Netflix if they enjoyed the great British baking show? This kind of thing is what data scientists do. Data science is combinatory and it is comparative. Here's a book called The Complutensian Polyglot, which was my nickname in high school. <laughs> That would be awesome. Published around 1520. This is a Bible, but instead of just one version of the text, it has at least three different languages, sometimes four, along with commentary. So I, I'm not going to point it out because I don't actually know which one's which right now. I know there are people in the room who know this book better than me. The purpose of this book is to provide the scholar with what we might call a combinatory and comparative perspective on a very complicated text like the Bible. Now, if we wanted to emphasize relevance, we might say that this book gives us an early form of data science. Sounds cool. But the opposite is also true. The only way we can think an idea like data science is that a book like this existed and continues to exist. And more to the point, data science is not as new as the rhetoric around data science might suggest. Do you see the difference? If our highest value, oops, you weren't supposed to see that. If our highest value is relevance, then the present becomes the measure of all things. And we cannot see the extent to which the past informs our intuitions, our values, and our imaginations. But if we set ourselves against relevance, we have something by which to understand the present. The past, we might say, populates the present. The past animates the present. It furnishes the present like a couch and a table furnish an empty room. So in this line of thought, now you can see it. Hold on, there we go. In this line of thought, Shakespeare's Othello, here in the first folio text published in 1623, it may not tell us everything we need to know about race. It definitely doesn't tell us everything we need to know. But it's really hard to understand how human beings have thought 
and now think about race without knowing the history of a play like Othello. At the very least, Othello reminds us that race and racism are not new. It is, after all, a play about a racist white man who ruins the legacy of a black man by, in, by inciting racism in other people. Or this book about women's fashion, published in 1640. I'm not kidding. This makes possible an understanding of the objectification and sexualization of women. Consider this image from the book. <laughs> it may not seem like it, but this is a sexualized image, or was in 1640, I'm told by scholars who write about this. <laughs> the past offers bitter medicine for the present, but it is still medicine. And this book, one of my favorites, where is it? Robert Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, on which Batman is looking like it's the city of Gotham. I worked hard for this shot, people, so please appreciate it. I was told, don't put Batman and Shakespeare on the books. And so, okay, thanks for noticing. All right, sorry. So this book is not really relevant for treating someone for depression. But our present understanding of depression can be specifically traced to this book. Depression has a story. And forgetting that story in the interest of mere relevance gives us an impoverished view and remarkably short-term view of mental illness. Finally, maybe you've noticed this, but we find ourselves in a time of pronounced political conflict. Don't worry, this is not going where you think. A time in which political discourse is, to say the least, divisive. Shakespeare and Batman had a fight. With that in mind, let me show you one of my favorite books at the Spencer. It's called his Majesty's Declaration, hold on, I lost the title. His Majesty's Declaration to all his loving subjects of the causes which moved him to dissolve the last parliament. <laughs> Published in 1640, the stated author of this book is King Charles I of England, that one. If 17th century England had anything like Twitter, it was this, it was the pamphlet form. As you can see, this book is relatively small. You can see it because Batman and Shakespeare are there. As you can see, the book is relatively small. It's a, it's a slim volume. It would have been pretty affordable, even for a middling reader, that is to say a middle class person, which was emergent in the period. In his declaration, that is this book, King Charles attempts to explain and defend directly to the reading public his decision to dissolve parliament because they wouldn't give him the money he wanted. Here's how the declaration begins, and I'm going to read it because it's amazing and I'm an English professor. <laughs> it is not unknown to most of His Majesty's loving subjects what discouragements he hath formerly had by the undutiful and seditious carriage of diverse of the lower house in the preceding assemblies of Parliament. Enough to have made him averse. Hold on, I lost my place. Enough to have made him averse to those ancient and accustomed ways of calling people together. Let's pause and translate. Parliament hurt Charles's feelings so bad that he wanted to set aside the rule of law. <laughs> Continuing. When instead of dutiful expressions toward his person and government, they, that is the House of Commons, vented their own malice and disaffections to the state and by their subtle and malignant courses endeavored nothing more than to bring into contempt and disorder all government. The House of Commons was so mean to Charles and they, they tried to destroy the government with their nasty, nasty words. That's kind of a silly paraphrase, but that's basically what it's saying. Note how one party in the conflict accuses the other party of tearing down political discourse. Note furthermore how the opposition is accused of trying to sabotage the government Shortly after this declaration, the English Civil War began. This war culminated in, you guessed it, the execution of Charles I for treason after he was convicted by, you guessed it, Parliament. <laughs> People are always surprised by that ending. That's like a major event. I'm sorry. Personally, and this is my main point, I take profound comfort in knowing and being able to examine with my hands the evidence that conflicted political discourse has a precedent. The present is made comprehensible by this material object from the past. This book is downstairs, y'all. 
<laughs> How, I ask you again, do we think about race, gender, depression, or political discourse, or even budget cuts, except by comparison to the past? That was for you, Carl. <laughs> no, it was. As the world changes, the material traces of the past matter more, not less. Ironically, if we shut the door to relevance and search the house for objects from the past, relevance sneaks in the window anyway. Try to be relevant, and you will only find fool's gold. But stand against relevance and study the objects, the stories, the people, the world of the past, and you will, quite by accident, find a deeper and more meaningful relevance than you ever dreamed possible. And that, my friends, is why the Spencer Library is the most important place on this campus. Thank you very much.